Welcome to our new program year. Whatever is your reason for attending church, for your spiritual and communal nourishment, or the beautiful music and the familiar words on a quiet morning, or in order to lose yourself in anonymous solitude and away from the places people might otherwise be looking for you, I pray that you find your time here sustains you in important ways. I think Jesus was looking for some anonymous solitude this morning when he went north to Tyre and Sidon near Lebanon and well north above the Sea of Galilee. And there he met a woman, as we read, who somehow knew who he was. I get it. I mean, at the very end of our reading, he tells people to keep quiet and they just keep telling everybody that they see. So people know who he is. Um, and he meets this woman in his solitude and his anonymi anonymity, and she asks for help for her daughter, whom she said was tormented by a demon. Now I picture the anguish of a mother with a child that she can't manage, perhaps violently and frighteningly unleashing at home against her and seeking desperate help. Any parent interceding for their child is a powerful drive. How helpless parents can feel, even as they send their children off to school or to a new job or to a new city to live, much less enduring injuries or illnesses and all of the remedies for them. So to discover one who can actually treat or protect the child is, in effect, to realize a sort of holy relief. And this Syrophoenician woman from the foreign territory that Jesus was visiting knew with holy relief that he was her answer, this stranger who'd come from a strange land. And Jesus responds in a peculiar way. He's human, after all, and he's seeking his respite. And now even these folks in the north are asking for help. So he blurts out, let the children be fed first, for it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Now, despite this startling response, I like that Jesus is portrayed this way, human and prone to blurting things which is how I read this passage this morning. It's as if he's saying, I'm tired. Take a number and wait, because I got others to attend to. And I can picture this woman, perhaps not surprised with this response from a Jewish healer in foreign country, deferential as she is, but pushing back with all the grace and dignity she can muster as a parent. Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Everyone's hungry. There are no exceptions. This vulnerability of hers, agreeing with Jesus and even using his hurtful images of dogs to describe herself and her daughter and their needs, is, I think, an astonishing combination of wisdom and resilience <clears throat> and a measure of truth because she changes Jesus' mind. She opens his eyes. For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. <clears throat> now, this story appears also in the Gospel of Matthew. It's pretty similar, except Jesus understands her words that she gives back to him about the dogs under the table as a hidden expression of her faith, and that it's her faith that has healed her daughter. Now, he often attributes healing and wholeness to one's faith. After all, just a couple of chapters earlier, we read of Jesus moving through the crowd and a woman touching the hem of his garment. And he says, your faith has made you well. It's almost as if he demurs, oh, shucks, it wasn't me. You did all the work. But in Mark's version of the story, Jesus realizes it's because of what she has said that her daughter is healed, the way she said it. 
in the original Greek, Jesus' literal response is, it is because of this word you can go. The demon has left your daughter. And Kat will know that the writer of Mark uses logos for this word, which also implies reason, reason and logic and is for the Greek culture still swimming around Palestine in the first century, Logos is also the ordering principle of the universe. So Jesus says, because of this word, this reasoning, this logic, this truth that you have given me, go. The demon has left your daughter. This Syrophoenician woman has given Jesus a gift from God through her by showing him a field of vision in which there is no rank according to position in society, only according to urgency and need. And seeing this, Jesus can no longer prioritize one tribe over another, Jews over Gentiles, or anyone over anyone else. All are children of God, no exception. Now, a week ago Thursday, my son Edmund asked me to toss the old pigskin around in the yard with him. Now, he loves that I played football in high school. I was even the captain of the team, which he loves even more. But what he's not willing to accept is that I'm a klutz. And I can't throw or catch the ball very well. In fact, I wasn't a very good football player. But we played catch anyway, because that's what I wanted to do with my boy before school started. We played catch on the playground. And I, I cut myself right here. You can't really see it, because the stitchers, all seven of them, are gone. Kirkham, how'd you cut yourself throwing a football? Well, I told you I was a klutz. I'll tell you about how it happened after church. But Beth Israel Milton, their ER practice, is a triage practice, like many ERs, and my injury, which needed stitches, was stable enough that I could wait. Others in the operating or waiting room were more needful. They had serious injuries. They were unstable, and they, of course, were seen first. At the ER, there is no priority of who you are before doctors see you. We all line up according to need. That's what triage is. And that is as it ought to be. Triage according to urgency and need. So while I was there, whiling away my time in the waiting room, talking to nurses and doctors, I struck up some conversations about what was going to happen the next day, Friday last week, a week ago this past Friday. You'll remember that Kearney Hospital which cared for nearby neighborhoods in Dorchester of mostly people of color or underinsured people or people with low income was closing its doors that day and all of the ambulances that once went to Kearney were now going to go to Beth Israel Deaconess Milton. And this hospital was closing because a private equity investor bought Kearney as part of the Caritas Christi system from the Archdiocese of Boston in 2010 and they renamed it Steward, funny that, renamed it Steward Healthcare and restructured it for sale again to a private management team, which then bankrupted it. And in the fire sale of Steward's hospitals, no one wanted to steward Kearney. So Kearney closed its doors. You'll see it if you drive up Dorchester Avenue. Hospital closed. Here, as is often the case, the rich benefit. The investment firm benefited. The management team, which earned its returns in this process, and all of the investors in that fund, and the poor suffer again in the sort of zero-sum game that we seem to play over and over again. And there are priorities here based not on need, but based on position. 
Now, to me, in our reading this morning, Jesus is signaling that when it comes to health and healing, he shows no partiality, but he attends to the need. Our health care system demands that people pay up for basic care, and our free market system allows hospitals to be privatized as leveraged buyout investments and traded. And all of this to the horror, I think, of the Syrophoenician woman, and thanks to her, also to Jesus. This is what the gospel confronts today. This is how the gospel is relevant today. This is what it looks like. And none of us can change an institution on our own or a system on our own but we can come together as a gospel community. A gospel community that pays attention and that asks questions and that thinks about issues when we make our decisions individually or as as a community and uses its voice when invited to use its voice to work towards a gospel purpose. We can teach one another through our outreach that we do as a parish and through the education that we gather as a parish and undertake, and we can help form the children who come through our doors and join us to learn about all of this, and Jesus too. For a people prioritized against, Isaiah reassures them not to fear, not to fear, but to hold fast in hope for the water that breaks forth in the wilderness. And for James, in our reading this morning, putting our faith to work helps to release that water. St. Michael's parishioners care for one another by helping with meals and rides for each other in times when some are limited, by supporting populations who come through our doors during the week seeking help in their disarray, by preparing and bringing meals to our siblings who are unhoused and suffering in downtown Boston through the Cathedral's MANA program, by furnishing all of our children across the town of Milton needing book bags for school, or our children who are enjoying camp at St. Stephen's in the South End, and welcoming families who come to Milton area for sanctuary from places of terror. Consider signing up to offer rides or meals to the needy among us, or to bring food, prepare food and bring food to the Mana community downtown, or any of the other multitude ways we can make the gospel walk. Enter the world with a gospel purpose. Because our church welcomes all without partiality. And we try to learn and build our voice for this work. The living faith of God's kingdom. And we have so many opportunities here to be incremental parts of that foundation. Small stones indeed, each of us. Working together as part of the greater whole. The work of the kingdom through our ministries requires many hands. And as we begin our program year together, I invite you to add your hands to all our church is becoming through the grace of God around us and also the grace of God that's within us. Amen.